Since there are so many plants, I ask them not to do every one of them, just highlight a few. Okay, that's fine. All right, everybody. Thanks for waiting. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome, everybody, to our June monthly program. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, thankfully, we had a, a, a dry day finally. It's been raining for like two weeks straight now, it seems. And uh, at least we get some uh, a, a bit of a break from that, although there's always something. And the heat today was, uh, was, was pretty incredible. But thank you guys for making your way here. Uh, as always, we have a few announcements on uh, on some upcoming events. Uh, you will. Oh, I just noticed that this is uh, is not showing here. One second, guys. Um, let's try this again here. All right. Uh, so yeah, we uh, we don't have much coming up in the uh, in the next uh, a few months. The reason being, we're about ready to uh, to get into our our regular summer break. Um, so we're not going to have uh, programs uh, here at Pinecrest Garden for the months of uh, July and August. Um, although there are still some things that are that are going to be happening. Uh, there's uh, still details to be determined, but there uh, will be a July social. Uh, we're still uh, planning that out, but uh, definitely stay tuned um, on the chapter calendar on datefmps.org uh, uh, and uh, to get to get information as it comes along. And we should be making uh, social media posts on that on that social as well. Um, additionally, on uh, on Saturday, July fifteenth, uh, I highly encourage everybody to check out Miami Dade County's Adopt a Tree. It's going to be the second one out of three for uh, for this uh, season. Uh, there's quite a, a good selection of plants uh, that they're going to have up, uh, available for adoption. Um, and these are red mulberry, Jamaican caper, Simpson stopper, Florida Keys black bead, and Crooks's holly. Uh, some of these are, are state threatened too, so it's a good a good way to get some um, uh, some some rare native diversity into your into your home if you're if you're just beginning with uh, with native landscaping. Um, our next monthly meeting will be all the way in September. Seems like a lifetime away, but September is going to be here probably tomorrow at the at the rate things are going. Um, so, it, uh, like always, it'll be held here at Pinecrest Garden, um, and it will be about the Cutler Slough Rehydration pot Project on tree species within the Deering Estate natural areas. And that presentation will be delivered by Catherine Castrillon. Uh, so, uh, we hope to see you at that next uh, that next meeting. Um, I'd like to take a moment to uh, to welcome uh, our new members. Uh, please welcome to the chapter Sonia Bauer, Karina Gomez, Anna Hockamer, Joe Garcia, Sage Hoffman, Marion Knowles, and Lauren Zitzman, who is joining us all the way from the uh, from the Keys. Um, are any <laughs> welcome? Are any of these folks here today? Hi, what's your name? Karina, pleasure, pleasure meeting you. Thank you for joining. And I hope you you enjoy uh, the presentations and, and all the things, you know, native plant related that we do. <laughs> um, I'd like to extend a, a thank you to everybody who uh, who donated plants. Uh, the raffle is one of the ways that we uh, that, that we fundraise to allow us to continue doing what we what we do. So thank you for for uh, for bringing in plants. 
Um, and I highly encourage you to check out the raffle table. There's always really cool plants there that are that are always really hard to uh, to come by. So uh, so definitely check them out. Um, and thank you to to uh, Susan, Jim, and Daniel Wheeler for always uh, assisting at the um, at the merchandise table. Definitely check that out as well. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, just while we have our presentation, kindly uh, silence or turn off your cell phones. Um, and as always, there's much more information and articles in the uh, in the newsletter as well as on social media. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, where you can find recordings of past presentations as well. And then of course, our website. And if you ever have any questions, our email address is datefmps at gmail.com. All right. So now we're gonna go ahead and, uh, oh, I usually have a, uh, a slide here on the raffle table. Uh, we're gonna take a few minutes to, uh, to uh, present the, uh, the plants at the raffle table. So the folks joining us on YouTube, please stand by. Uh, audio might be a little bit low for, for a few minutes, uh, but Raul, thank you for, uh, for agreeing to uh, present the plants. Raul, quick, quick question. Uh, just yeah. so the folks can have some audio, do you mind just? Sure. You can just hold it there. Sure. Um, we have a, a cinnamon bark, really tiny. It's a seedling. They grow to be uh, medium-sized trees uh, with cinnamon-like bark. As that's a relative of the cinnamon tree. Blue porter weed. We have two uh, teas thoroughworts or shrub thoroughworts. Uh, don't see this very often here. It's a medium-sized shrub with uh, cinnamon aster-like flowers without ray florets. It does attract butterflies and, and other things fairly commonly. A uh, Cassia ligustrina, a, a privet, uh, uh, um, sen uh, a privet senna, uh, also an ecotone plant, uh, grows to about this high, maybe five six feet. Handsome um, tends to get a little little leggy and needs to be cut back. Some cas some cassias attract butterflies. This is supposed to be one of the sulfur attracting cassias. I've not seen a lot of sulfurs around the ones I have at home, but it's nevertheless a very handsome plant. A, uh, a triad of uh, gumbo limbos, it looks like. And this is lancewood, which is very handsome, medium-sized tree, hammock tree. Also, there's like three little seedlings there. This is Simmons aster, uh, also uncommon aster here, Sympiotrichium simonzi, uh, found uh, recently by the Fairchild people also at uh, John and Penny Thompson Park. We have um, a couple of Scutellaria havanensis. There's one here, one that away, another shrub thoroughwort here, and then white copper seedlings. This is um, Pisalis walteri, the Walter's brown cherry, very pretty um, creeping plant with handsome uh, tomatillo tasting. Um, Fruit. If you've never had it, this is, this is like, the, as Steve Woodman's, he says, the most delicious native fruit in South Florida. This says Salis angulata, which I, I, I confess I've never seen this before uh, and can't say anything about it. Um, this is a wild petunia, very pretty, also probably one of the prettiest Pineland flowers, it, it, ephemeral flowers last a day, purple, about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half across, beautiful flower. This is an uncommon grass to see here or anywhere. This is um, arrow feather three on. It's pretty common in the Pinelands, but it, in the in the commercial industry, you can't find it. This is, this is a hard to get plant. Very handsome when it grows in full sun. Plumping grass goes to about two, three feet. And the, the, the seed has three little spikes at the at the end. That's why three. Left. 
So note that viscosa, a very handsome medium sized medium -sized tree, shiny leaves in full sun, they get really shiny. Um, it's a handsome medium sized tree. A importer weed, which all are familiar with, several pig seeds. These are for the label. These are Leavenworthies. Um, if you've never had these in a full sun garden, you must plant these because they will form a cluster of the most spectacular yellow flowers. Um, and they will bloom not just in the autumn, they'll bloom a lot of times, uh, several times a year. Just a, just one plant will have a, a cluster of flowers in any garden. So, the flowers, although not big, um, are very pretty. And then something I've never seen here, if I've seen it maybe once, is a Yenia euphrasifolia. This is, this is about as big as these plants get. They are creeping pineland plants. If you have a, a loop or magnifying glass, you can see these little teeny tiny flowers that hang up the little flowers you ever want to see. Uh, they look like something from outer space, but they're microscopic almost. Um, this is Pan American balsam scale. This is a clump grass, a very handsome, uncommon clump grass, also an ecotone grass that uh, will look like three feet tall with the spikes maybe three and a half or four feet. Very pretty to be cut back as well. This is blue eyed grass, the uh, also in full sun with a lot of water to get spectacular. Back here, we have four. Uh, its fan petals, and one has its little up flower. The this is Cedar um, Elioti, and this is the pine land analog of the weedy cedars that we have in the lawn everywhere. But once you see the flower, it's like a weed, and it's actually pine land equipment. Narrow leaves grows a little bit bigger than this, maybe. Very handsome when they do bloom. Flower is pokeweed, which everybody who's from up north or anywhere else in the country knows. Here, they're uncommon. You see them occasionally, but they are great bird attractants in the um, fall when the seeds, uh, uh, when the fruits ripen. Um, very toxic if uh, uncooked. Folks in the deep south will eat this. Um, boil it three times in water. You can eat it just like salad greens. <clears throat> this is Ravina humulus, the rouge plant. It's a uh, this is kind of a scraggly one I brought in. It will get better in soil. The thing about the rouge plant that makes it is that not only does it have attractive flowers and attractive little red berries with bird attractants, but it also is one of the few plants that grows well in deep shade. So if you have a hammock planting and you want some stuff underneath, this will grow well in, in shade. Um, orchid, ground orchid, little spikes. So this get to have multiple little um bulbs and they'll have course uh, twice a year usually this is a it's a white bracted sedge i want to say it's rinka this is not a running one but they're both moist soil there's several uh symphotrichium formerly aster and natus clasping aster beautiful flowers in the fall about three quarters of an inch to an inch wide uh, pink, purple, lavender. There are two Asclepias incarnatas, which is an uncommon plant in the county. Swamp milkweed that you see all up and down the East Coast. Uh, full sun, water, fantastic plant. I, butterflies don't get it. I can't grow in dry swamp plant. This has got to have the soil really moist and full sun. There's two Grosses, um, butterfly weed. They're actually from Fairchild, the progeny of Fairchild, uh, so they're actually from Bay County. Uh, I think these are you know, the same Elliot Paris species. Um, they're, they're wetland sedges, very handsome. They'll grow maybe a little bit bigger than this, but that's it. If you have a very sunny, wet location, they do real well. And then there is a host of crotillarias. These are pumulus, right? Yep. They have three leaflets. These are spectacular plants. Also, uh, the, the host plant of the Bella moth, uh, whose name I can't remember, but it's a day flying orange and white spotted moth. Very, very pretty. If you've seen it, you'll know it. This is silk grass. 
uh, very handsome also um, autumn blooming uh, autumn blooming aster uh, very nice specimens of I think this is viola sororia the native uh, violet I think it's the only violet native to, to, to this part of the Florida and this is a, a handsome one or few actually look uh, this is uh, Hamelia patens um, and planted to it is Chromalina odorata. I thought that's what it was, also known as uh, man in the bush or jack in the bush. Um, this is a this is a, the most aggressive plant that you ever want to see. Be careful with it. Um, I, 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 I uh, they're really a phenomena. This is a very so true. Yes, very good. So it's three and one. Wow. This is a, a handsome seedling of pigeon plum. Um, looks real nice. The, these will get to be very handsome, medium-sized trees. Uh, the berries are edible for humans and other animals. Uh, crabwood, also a handsome tree. Uh, very long-lasting leaves. They don't fall off at all. And uh, do my eyes deceive me? Three seedlings of devil's potatoes. These are these are very nice. Um, except that you don't can't eat the the tubers because you'll die. The <laughs> This is a milkweed relative, um, Senaceae, and uh, make really handsome, handsome climbing vines. These things will live forever and climb up a palm tree or any kind of tree. Very, very pretty. And there was there was another one. Oh, yeah, these guys. So um, the fairy hibiscus, hibiscus popigi, is something we've seen here a couple times only. Um, very pretty, um, blooming with little little uh, Malvasia-like seeds that have already opened up. Uh, fantastic shrub, this is the best I've seen. And this is a beauty berry, right? And it's got something else in the middle that I can't tell what that is. Does anyone know what this is? This thing in the middle? Nobody, okay. Very handsome. And I think that's that's it, right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, one more item. Ooh. All right, everybody. Now it's time for uh, for our main events. Thank you again, Raul, for your for your always awesome plant uh, plant introduction. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, to introduce Charlie uh, De Vente. Uh, uh, just to say a bit about him. Uh, Charlie is a Miami native and tech entrepreneur who started Reforest Miami to help raise awareness of native plants. His love for our ecosystem came from hiking in the Everglades as a kid with the Boy Scouts and from learning about our ecology while attending Math Academy and working at Radman. Uh, during the day, he is president of Gather AI, a supply chain robotics company, and at night he works to raise awareness of native plants. Charlie is also a new uh, board member of DCFMPS. Uh, he lives in Pinecrest with his wife and two children. So in addition to the presentation, this is also a pretty neat introduction on Charlie himself. So, see you guys in All right, thank you very much. Do I need a mic check on the stream? Can you tell? That's all good? Okay, awesome. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's, it's a total honor to be here. Um, I feel a bit of an imposter because I think I know less about plants than anyone in this room, um, but I promise I love them as much. And I'm gonna bring some new material that I'm told is not really often spoke here about how do we raise awareness? How do we connect with the mainstream? Uh, when I talk to my neighbors, none of them have ever heard of the Native Plant Society or really know what native plants are. And it's a total shame because I hold um, what's been done here for decades in such high esteem. And I hope uh, just being part of the board to bring the message out and really help people connect with what I think is our most original cultural heritage, right? Like the plants that were here before us, they really define all of, uh, you know, humanity's experience in, the, in, the, in Miami and it's mostly gone now. So uh, let's dive in. Um, it's okay to be, uh, ruckus is fine. So if you wanna talk, it's very open. If you don't like what I'm saying, please chime in. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun here. Okay, um, let's see. You want to help me out here? Brian, it's not advancing. Yeah. We need to click on it, maybe. Try that. 
I'm going to click on it. What about now? There it goes. I think, uh, or maybe left okay. and right, it seems. Oh, good. All right. So as Brian said, so I'm, I'm, I'm local. My mom is here. Uh, my mom. Uh, grew up four or five miles that way. Um, I came here uh, for part of school after Hurricane Andrew uh, when, when our school was knocked down. Just a lot of, a lot of love for, um, you know, uh, what I consider to be a home. I was gone for a while, um, nine years in Pittsburgh and nine years in D.C. for school and work. Did a bunch of tech stuff. Um, talk about it later, maybe. Um, but I, I've been home since 2015, and that sort of has uh, reawakened my love for our ecology. Um, I learned a lot about it growing up. Um, but when I came here, um, we just moved into our house in Pinecrest, and we had a stand of fully mature Bischofia. It's, you know, your typical invasive monoculture, over a dozen trees that are a foot in diameter or larger. And I knew I wanted to, to get rid of it. Um, so that started a project uh, during COVID where um, we chopped it all down. And uh, this is the front yard now. But I, I, uh, I, re I remember from a college class in high school seeing a cross-section diagram of, of Florida ecosystems. And this came from the USGS survey. And they show you know, typical aquatic uh, freshwater plants coming up to you know, cypress on the waterline, low and highland hammock plants, pine rockland. And I'm an engineer, and I'm not normal. <laughs> So like, oh, I want to have them in the backyard. I want to look out the window and I want to see the different ecosystem zones. And, and I don't know why I want that, but that's, that's what I wanted to do. So did a project during COVID. Um, this, is the, this is the front. This is the recent part. We're in the Pinecrest Canal. So we put over 200 species of native plants in the backyard, lots of endangered stuff. Um, brought in bobcats, made an elevated area for Pine Rockland. Um, we did a lot of water mitigation on the property. Um, we're going to try to do a visit, I think, in the fall once it cools off. So I'd love to have you all over and show you. But this is a picture of the front yard where we redid um, in January. It's part of a TV show I'll talk about. But this is on the Pinecrest Canal. And, you know, being local and thinking water first, instead of, hey, what, how does it look from the street? I wanted a place where, uh, what's a great place to paddle to, right? Kind of your favorite freshwater creek uh, native. I wanted to have that here because I felt a big connection to the cypress we have here in, in Pinecrest Gardens, which is the very last remaining tract of Snapper Creek. And you know the canal's artificial, but I, I'm told it was loosely follows the 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 contours of where Snapper Creek might have been. And you know, it's time we start putting that back. So I, I was hoping that this would look like that uh, 100 years after I'm dead, and uh, you know maybe 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 start something. So we'll talk about we'll talk about all that stuff. So um, you know, enough about me. So we're going to talk about the Holocene extinction, and probably a lot of people here know about this already. But I'm going to define the problem so we just have common ground. Um, so I asked AI to make a picture of a Tyrannosaurus going extinct while using an iPhone. <laughs> I don't, it just, it, it, seemed, it seemed like a way to talk about it. Um, but on the geological record, no one was around, right? But on the geological record, we've clustered um, extinction patterns that we see in five major groups. So it's not, it's not so perfect, but there's considered to be on the record five major mass extinction events. You've all heard about the dinosaurs and the meteors and all that stuff, right? Um, but what not everyone knows now, um, outside of this room, is this is happening again now, right? We're going, undergoing a mass extinction event today, and it's caused by us, right? By our development, by our habitat destruction, um, and it's, it's called the Holocene extinction, right? It's the era that we're in. So it's, it's a really terrible thing, and uh, something that, you know, I, I would love to dedicate my life to and try to move the needle a little bit. So to put some numbers to it, here's the graph. So you can see, this is, again, this is correlation, not causation. It's possible that there's something else going on. You tell me, but the, the rise in human population over recent centuries and the rise in extinctions is just really, really incredible. Um, and, you, you know, you see this, right? You drive down to Robert is here, where now developments are here, and before farms were here. And, you know, it's, um, we just kind of bulldoze whatever we can uh, for our own enjoyment. And, you know, I don't, I don't know when it stops. But there's so many holes now. I'm, this is this is the this is the sad part of the presentation. It's gonna get more fun and inspiring later. But this this is like the doom and gloom, right? Uh, we have to write books now about um, why certain animal and plant patterns don't make sense, right? So, uh, have you ever thought about uh, how were avocados spread? Right, like what what mammal can pass a seed so large? Right, it's like well, there there is no animal like that that's alive, right? There's Theorized to be uh, giant sloths that are now extinct. Uh, you know, all the megafauna that were hunted by by us. Um, and and excuse me. So.
So there's, there, I'm talking too fast. Oh, sorry. So I'll slow down. Um, but now we have so many missing species that it's hard to understand um, how does the world work? How do things fit, right? How, how do plants that have uh, their, their missing, missing uh, animals to spread them, like how, how, are they, how are they even there? So it's, it's, a, it's a massive problem and it's only getting worse. So um, why do I care about this? Um, a lot of people these days seem to spend a lot of their time on Netflix and buying stuff online. And, you know, that's cool. Uh, I don't, you know, that, that's a lot of fun too, but, uh, you know, I'm 40, 43. I got a couple kids and I think we all had a glimpse of our mortality uh, during COVID and we're hoping for something to do with a little bit more meaning. So to me, this is uh, maybe, a, maybe a higher calling or something that I want to um, call people to against all the consumerism and the stuff we have all day long is, you know, maybe, maybe there's something bigger we can do that has a more lasting effect on, on our legacy. So like, let's talk about that, right? There's, that, that, that's a big thing, right? So there's a lot of pieces to saving the planet. There's biodiversity, there's climate change, there's pollution, lots of other stuff. Um, climate change is the problem of our century. Like our survival literally depends on it. Um, lots of people are working on this, thankfully. There's more awareness, there's more policy. And I felt like I'm not gonna move the needle on this, right? If I spend all my effort on it. And the reason I find biodiversity compelling is that there's like a thousand times less attention, a thousand times fewer people working on it. And you know, I don't wanna live in a world where we address climate change somehow, whatever the outcome's gonna be. And then like everything's dead, right? There's no, there's no point to me um, for that outcome. So I feel like I can have a much bigger impact on biodiversity. And that's why I kind of like am going in this direction. Um, so here's examples of misguided policies, right? So when I look at this, I don't think I see what most people see, uh, solar farm. What I see is a dead zone. Um, and you know, solar is a very, I'm gonna start poking holes. Uh, so sorry if I uh, bother people, but solar is a very important part of our future, but I think solar belongs on the roof. And when you uh, take a bunch of land and fill it with solar farms, you're basically saying nothing can ever live here again for the duration of this uh, project. And it's an example of we, we focus on one goal to the ex expense of others, right? Ethanol to me is a similar thing, right? We're trying to solve one narrow thing and we don't look at the externalities. We don't look at to whether it's even carbon neutral, right? Um, we don't look at to whether it's, it's, a, it's a good way to solve a problem. We're just focused on one thing. So, to me, this is like the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico outside the Mississippi Basin, except that we did this on purpose and we're proud of it. <laughs> so uh, I think there's different ways to solve the problem. We need to have a more holistic view. And I think we should make some more noise for, for the biodiversity um, when we consider how to you know, perform geoengineering to, to address some of our human challenges. So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna raise some more tough questions, but. To me, I just want to get started of, of what's, what's missing from the conversation and how can we help? So within biodiversity, um, again, there's a lot of angles, restoration, conservation, research. Um, I'm an engineer, so I like to build things. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a scientist, so uh, we have a lot of experts and great activity going on here. And restoration would fail if we didn't understand what we were doing, right? Because how would we restore? And also, if we weren't preserving our natural areas, which are really our genetic base for any restoration. So I want to acknowledge those efforts. Um, but also, I, I maybe have a better uh, applicability of my skills to, to a portion of this problem. Uh, and then within it, right, like, you know, I have some organizational abilities, but really technology and marketing is maybe where I add more to the conversation. And I can also do them at night when the kids are in bed. So <laughs> small practical things. This is what we're going to talk about today, right? It was in the context of biodiversity. How do we apply technology and marketing? which I don't think are common subjects of the National Native Plant Society, but how do we apply these ideas to, um, to restoration and the Holocene extinction specifically? Okay, so I don't know the answers. I'm not a scientist, but uh, thankfully others have some ideas. So um, I don't think, some of these books are for sale in the back, um, a different Italian book, but a lot has been written by people uh, with uh, you know, much, much greater experience than I do. Um, Eo Wilson passed away recently. And he wrote a book that motivated me a lot called Half Earth. And I'm going to simplify a very complex idea so that we have a marketing headline, right? But the idea of the book is that if we preserve half of the earth for nature, we can save about 80% of species from extinction, right? And like, no, I don't believe the computer models. I don't think it's, it's that simple. It's a lot more complicated. But I think that idea is very powerful, um, that you can have agency. You can do something. There's like actually like a way and a benchmark that we can shoot for on how to stop this. 
Um, and also Doug Chalamy, um, I read a bunch of his stuff and that really motivated me where it's like, if we're gonna save half of the earth for nature, it can't just be deserts and mountain ranges, right? In most cases we built on the best and most productive land. We've cut it down for agriculture, we put our houses on it. So nature is something that has to be at home, right? It can't be a place that you only see on TV or drive to once a year when you're, until your bug spray runs out and come home. But I really need to um, engage the audience, engage consumers and people to love nature again, right? And so it's a key part of the solution. So, um, so here's the mission statement, right? How do we stop the Holocene extinction? Is that we can renaturalize half the planet with native plants. Um, again, there's more to it. There's a whole ecosystem. But if you want to boil down something to a simple challenge for people, something you can tell your neighbors, um, this is how I'm wording it. So let's click into that. Um, there's two parts, uh, or I'm breaking it into two parts. One is to renaturalize developed areas. So this means where we live and work, at home, you know, uh, uh, our, our neighborhoods, our, our cities. Um, another one, which we'll talk about maybe at the end if there's time, I don't know if there will be, you gotta keep me honest, Brian, um, is how do we rewild agricultural and vacant lands where people, where people don't live? And that's, I think it's a very different problem, but there's solutions for that too. So let's talk about number one. So how do we renaturalize developed areas? Oops, here we go. Um, so I believe that change is driven by social norms. And the most powerful way to change behavior is to work the ideas of esteem versus shame, right? We all want to be popular. We all want to be loved. We all want to love ourselves, right? I think uh, if, you, if you look at the past few decades, there's been tremendous change in social norms around littering and around cigarette smoking. And it's, it's really incredible if you just consider over, over like a 50 year time horizon, how much attitudes have changed. And these weren't driven by laws, right? There are laws about both of these things. But I think laws follow the social norms. And I think the social norms are driven by something else. You know, what do we consider to be honorable? What are we considered to be likable or popular? And, and that's really, it's really changed. And if you don't believe me about the laws, just look at texting while driving. <laughs> that's illegal and everyone is doing it. And everyone's constantly getting in car crashes because we don't care. It's not one of our norms. But I feel like if you want to change attitudes around having native plants at home, you first start with the social norms as a way to influence people and make it, make it cool again. Um, but there's a problem, right? Native plants have a demand problem. Um, when it comes to production capacity, we have lots of it. If you know about these farms, you might laugh at my icon choice. Uh, for distribution and services, we got lots of distribution. Uh, we have artificial grass companies. We have uh, True Green, the, the enemy. Um, but when it comes to demand for native plants, what I hear is, yuck, those plants look too every lazy. It's like literally what people are saying, right? And they don't recognize that that is what was all here, right? This, this, this image that you have when you drive down the street and you see the poinciannas and uh, it's, it's like not, that's not Miami, it's not here at all. And if we can just change that, everything else will fall into place, right? You know, Home Depot is not the enemy. Imagine if they had uh, endangered plants area, right? Hey, come save the planet, get these plants, right? I think we just need to change consumer demand and everything else will change to follow um, that, that lead. So this is what I'm positing. And I'm trying to narrow the problem into something a lot simpler and easier to solve. So, um, so why is there a demand problem? And I'm saying it's lack of identity with our natural environment. Um, so I, I Googled um, a Miami uh, street shot, and this is the number one result. Uh, this is what we're known for. <laughs> It's all exotic plants. This is our image. There's no, native, there's no native plant here to see. This is the most Instagrammable streets in Miami, right? And this goes on and on. This is our image. This is who we are. And, and as you know, it's like not who we are at all, right? This is new thing that people have installed. And, uh, you know, the po point Sienna's don't really have any ecosystem support whatsoever. Um, you know, this is really a dead zone for, for most uh, animals and, and insects that might try to live there. And it looks green, but it's, but it's, it's pretty dead. So we, we can do better. Um, here's what my neighbors think about invasive species. We're going to have a candlelight vigil in memory of the Muscovy ducks. Uh, and I thought they were native as a kid too. They were in the canal. And now people are, are in a panic um, because they're calling the ducks for the ecosystem pressure they put. And I'm not going to mention the Egyptian geese or whatever, but they're trying to, they're trying to like save the ducks. And it's like, who's, who's, I have, a, I have a relative and I won't say who they are, but they wanna go kill the limpkins who now are in their season and making noise. And, and other people wanna save the Muscovies. It's completely backwards. Um, poor peacocks just minding their business in the middle of this concrete jungle. Like 
The peacocks are not from the concrete jungle. I'm sorry. Um, how do we protect peacocks here in Cutler Bay? There should be a law. Um, invasive wildlife removal. This guy kills animals for a living. How disturbing, right? This is this is what we think. And I'm not trying to make light of killing animals. It's it's it should be uh, avoided whenever possible. But this concept that uh, this ignorance of invasive species and the damage they have on the animals that are supposed to be here um, is just is completely unknown and, and doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, and the Muscovy ducks have more Instagram followers than the natives, right? This is this is completely ridiculous. Like I look at the world and it makes no sense. It's like I'm, I've gone insane. Everything is upside down. Uh, there's a TV show when I was a kid where they've had upside down day and everything is backwards. And I feel like I live, I live in this. <laughs> um, uh, so sometimes the authorities are uh, enforcing this too. So this is a this is a nasty gram that I got from the South Florida Water Management District. I planted about a dozen trees. Uh, Howard planted them. I didn't plant them um, along the canal bank that's off of my property. And they threatened me with a $10,000 fine per day for planting a dozen trees. It's completely outrageous. They plant, and they didn't even tell me, they put it on a stake, like, like you would put a head on a stake. They, they, they put this paper on a stake where the trees were planted, hoping that I would find it. And this is how they notify me that I'm, you know, uh, it's Eighth Amendment, I think, uh, cruel and unusual punishment. I think it's completely like, like out of whack. It makes no sense. Um, on the, on the same canal, we're having crazy erosion problems, mostly because of the iguana burrows, another, another, another invasive species problem. And there is no budget to shore up the seawalls, right? So instead, I planted a bunch of trees. Um, the trees get stronger every year, unlike the seawall, which gets weaker every year due to, to the scupping and erosion underneath it. And, and somehow, I'm the enemy. Um, keep going. Uh, so what is our state flower? It's the orange blossom. Oranges are from Asia. <laughs> this is marketing by the agricultural industry, right? But it's, it's stuck now. Now we have the orange bowl with the orange this, Florida oranges. This is literally our brand, right? Like it's, it's, it's totally backwards. It's mind blowing. I have the Coreopsis down here, just hoping they creep in a little bit. It, it, Coreopsis are our state wildflower. So we do have a little bit of native representation, but like everything is backwards and we're sort of, it's like stuck in our culture and re reinforcing it. Um, even the people in charge. So I'm sorry if anyone here is from this organization. This is Dade Heritage Trust. This is their uh, Canopy Coalition master plan. And the cover for Dade Heritage Trust for restoring our canopy is the Poinciana. So it's, it, goes all the way, it goes all the way down. So, um, and, and here's where I uh, express my personal guilt. So I had this problem too. Um, I grew up here. Loving mangoes, you know, it's part of my identity. And in college, uh, one of my best friends was Indian, and I slept over at his parents' house. And for breakfast, they're serving me mango chutney. And they're, I'm like, they're Indian. Like, how are you guys into mangoes? You know? <laughs> and like, I had no idea. Like, no, oh, those are from, they're from India. <laughs> you know, somehow we're like this mango cat. To me, it was my identity was mangoes. Like, they're from here, or they're my, they're my thing. And it's not true at all, right? So, like... Uh, I would fertilize my lawn seven years ago. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody. But having just come through this, I'm trying to kind of share my journey, and um, and talk about how that's how how to improve it. So it's really, really bad. But the reason I'm saying that is because even a small change can make a big impact, right? It's when when things are worse that I think a small a small improvement makes makes the most difference. So so how do we fix the awareness problem? Is to remind people that they have always loved nature. Like since they were a kid, every kid loves nature, right? Help them get back to their roots, help them seek identity around this stuff. This is, this is what I think, and this is how we get into the marketing stuff. Um, there's a quote from the author of The Little Prince, right from that book, it's a children's book. And he says, if you wanna build a ship, don't drum up the people. He says men, but don't drum up the people um, to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. You know, he says, instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea, right? So when you, when you create the desire in people, um, that's what really drives their behavior instead of just constantly issuing orders, making more policies, like shaming people, it's just make, make them love something. And I think it's gonna be easy because the good news is that native plants are awesome. <laughs> so um, I think we need to appeal to their direct consumer benefits. I don't think the slogan is save the planet. I think the slogan is, what if I could save you money from no mowing? 
What if you could uh, fight climate change by sinking CO2? What if you could save the bay, improve your mental health, and bring your own yard alive with nature? Right? I think this is a story we have to tell. Um, you know, I have some fun southern fog fruit that attract the dragonflies to eat the mosquitoes. Right? Um, these, are the, these are the things that I think will um, connect with consumers a lot more than the lofty, you know, we're going to save the planet and we're going to have a half a earth and all that sort of stuff. We need to speak their language. Um, so let's, let's talk about how that can work. Um, I think native plants will sell themselves if we get the word out. Um, it's not like life insurance. Uh, there's, there's a joke in my generation that nobody sells drugs, they sell themselves. And I feel like if you um, just connect people with the native plants, we'll have that same kind of innate appeal. So we have a bunch of tools at our disposal and we need to use all of them, right? We have entrepreneurship, uh, nonprofit, which we're doing right now, and, and policy. And I think they all are part of the puzzle. Um, but I want to stop for a second. Can you just raise your hand if you're a little bit skeptical about this capitalist world we've been in? And then maybe this like limitless consumerism where we just destroy the entire environment and, and just to satisfy ourselves and there's no end. And we like, we keep consuming power and we keep destroying stuff. Like, okay, I'm a capitalist technocrat and I have the same concern. It's totally messed up. I don't have the answer. I don't think anyone does. Our society definitely doesn't. And we're not going to talk about that today. It's off topic. But I'd like to employ you for a moment, if you're one of these skeptics, just consider entrepreneurship as a tool. And if you still hate it, then like learn the tool of the enemy uh, <laughs> so you can use it against them. But I think this is a very important part of the puzzle that is missing around native plants. Um, because you know, non nonprofits, you know, to me, this is the ivory tower that we're in right now, right? The most knowledge, the most true mission. Um, we're the most agile. We can just do stuff like this right now when we feel like it. Like no one tells, no one's told me not to so far. <laughs> um, but we have limited resources, right? We're raffling plants, which is, I'm just, I'm just impressed by the, the spread of biodiversity that's there. It's more than any yard in Miami. But this, this is how we fund our operations, right? Um, on policy, right? Policy is good for a lot of things. It doesn't solve everything at all, right? I think it's the slowest moving. And I think it really needs to follow um, sentiment. It doesn't drive, it doesn't drive sentiment. Uh, entrepreneurship on their hand is self-funding. I guess, I guess policy is self-funding too. Uh, <laughs> but entrepreneurship is self-funding and the fastest scaling. And it has, like we just talked about the pure profit motive. So I think connecting these things is how you can get something that emerges that's a combination of all of them. So here's the strategy. So um, when it comes to marketing strategy for native plants, I'm proposing that number one is we leverage societal trends and we don't fight them. So we don't uh, fight consumerism. You're never going to fix it. Uh, I think you should leverage consumerism. So it's a, uh, native plants are the newest thing to buy. Biodiversity is the new climate change is a slogan. Um, there is a guy, and you can Google him, as a Wall Street Journal article. If you're a super rich McMansion owner and you just built your thing in the neighborhood of the other McMansions, guess what? You don't stand out at all. So this guy will drive you around the old neighborhoods until you pick the oak tree that you want, century old tree. He'll go in and cut a deal with the owner and then he's got a patented system for cutting the tree down and slicing it vertically uh, with saws. He'll put this ancient tree on flatbeds, keep it alive somehow, bring it to your McMansion and then reassemble it like Frankenstein with aircraft cable and ratchet straps. And now you have this amazing thing that your, uh, your neighbors don't. And as horrible as that is, like that's 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 the 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 tip of the spear of influence of of what rich cool people do. So like let's use it, right? Use it to our advantage. Make native plants the thing that you should get. Copy that. Don't don't make that a thing that we hate, right? This is a little bit of the judo move. Uh, nationalism. I'm going to pick on the other side. Uh, American soil is for American plants. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What are American plants? Do you even know? Which of your plants are American? Nobody knows. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun with that one. Um, I think people should really question the world around them, just like I'm doing now. Um, what, what really represents us? Like, is it your Netflix? Is it, is it your Amazon account? Is it, is it something else? Is, it, is nature part of that? Is you know, preserving the environment for your kids part of that? I, should it be? I don't know. And then, and then nobility, um, I think these don't really work. It's, it's the bad ones that are more interesting, but um, you know, getting people to consider the impact of their actions, the, the externalities, like what happens when you make a choice, when you buy the new thing, right? Instead of, instead of uh, doing anything else. 
So, uh, so let's, let's work these themes a little bit. Um, so I started this thing called Reforest Miami, and this is an experiment. It's a platform for testing some of these ideas to see what happens. So um, uh, it's even erroneous in its name, right? Because as you know, many of you know, this isn't a forest. Like Pine Rockland is classified as a savanna because it has less than 50% canopy. Um, but I'm calling it Reforest Miami because I'm, again, I'm trying to make compromises to access the mainstream and speak language, the language that people understands. And to say that we would Reforest Miami is preposterous. Like, was it ever a forest? Wasn't it always like nightclubs and neon and, you know, and, and, and fast cars? Like that, that idea I think is completely absent. So I'm trying to challenge perceptions. Um, so let's, let's do that some more. So mom, you'll recognize your neighbor here. Uh, <laughs> so um, my mom's neighbor, this, this was like an overgrown front backyard. You've seen this sort of houses turned into a golf course. Uh, I thought it was horrible, right? And white on white on white. It's literally like nothing can live here. And there was even a spring sign, I think, that was a cherry on top of the cake. And, and you know, maybe, maybe it looks like a magazine, but it's, you know, I'm calling it an ecological dead zone, right? This actually was redone. There's a Studio Cuesta guy on Instagram who he somehow got this project. And it's, it's pretty nice now. There's, there's, some, there's some native palm trees. Uh, it's, it's, it's improved. But, um, you know, I, I want to call into question uh, what's hip and modern. Um, okay. Uh, this is a McDonald's on US-1, full of Chef Flair uh, with a little Brazilian pepper on top. Uh, why don't we shame it, right? You know, if, 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 this, if this was dumping gas or whatever into the street, we would all have a panic. Like the cops would be there, we would freak out, right? But when you shut it off, it's done. And instead, these plants are uh, spreading uh, environmental hazard that, is, that reproduces, right, uh, endlessly. Right, and why don't why don't we call this out? Why don't we make it shameful to have chef flares in your yard the way it would be shameful to have a broken down car? Um, this is my other neighbor. Uh, you know, you know this pattern too, right? Concrete front yard, maybe with little strips of fake grass. I think I think that's supposed to be put in here. Uh, <laughs> and and if you if you like were on purpose trying to maximize flooding and and run off uh, from your driveway into the bay, this is exactly what you would do: is you would pave your whole front yard. No porosity. I don't even know how this is legal, um, but it, it's 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 like the worst thing that you can do with with rising sea level. Um, so then this is the after. Not only did that same person finished the project, he put in 100% exotic plants. Raul saw this with me. He, this is certified. This is only exotic plants minus the Saint Augustine uh, and an American flag. And this to me is the poster child for like you know uh, American soils for American plants. You're so proud of your national identity. You even have two Teslas, right? <laughs> you care about something like, and how come you don't, you have complete ignorance of what plants are. Um, so th this is why I think like it's, it's all there. All the potential energy is there for change. You just got to catalyze it with a little bit, of, with a little bit of thinking. Um, so do you know where your plants come from, right? Do you even know um, the, the things that we have everywhere, the podocarpus, the clusia, um, you know, it's, it's like, where, where, where is it from? Nobody knows, right? But we need to spread word that the things that people have the most visual identity for, um, the things you see the most driving down the street, like none of them are from here. Um, uh, who, who, would, who would pay into a GoFundMe uh, for this billboard? I, I have a site, um, Keg South on US 1 and 104. There is a huge uh, billboard there. And right now it's like the Kohler 2.0 smart toilet. And, uh, and that sounds really exciting, but I think we can replace it. I think it's five grand a month. Uh, five to ten, I, haven't, I haven't priced out that particular one, but it's very, very doable. Um, and I don't know anyone who's like insulted a plant, um, but I think may, may, and, and we shouldn't insult plants. The plant isn't bad. Right, but that that concept, right? That like what I need now is more clusia is is I think you know it's need, need to be pulled into question. Um, what about, would you fund this one? <laughs> I'm I'm trying to find the edge. Like when do I lose people? Uh, we, we 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 can get worse. I have some I have some worse stuff than this. But uh, again, we got we got to like like really challenge challenge the norms. Um, the stickers they have for abandoned cars. If you leave it on, on the roadway, the orange like hey, come get your cars and get trashed. Why don't we put those? Why don't we have a campaign? Um, this is again, like bordering on, on not legal anymore. Uh, <laughs> but why don't we get graffiti kids teaching about native plants, 
give them a stack of stickers. I'm sorry about, about, about invasive plants. Give them a stack of stickers and then, and then start tagging them, right? Imagine if you woke up, you didn't know, and you had this like horrible sticker on your front yard shufflera. Like maybe, maybe, maybe we would raise a few questions. Um, okay, but the good news is that we're not starting this now. There already is a renaturalization movement, right? This is already happening. And, and let's talk about it. So um, maybe you guys have heard of freedom lawns. You just stop using chemicals, that's it. You don't have to do anything, right? You just stop using chemicals, no pesticide, no fertilizer. You can mow, you cannot mow, let it get really weedy. But you know, within a few years, the, the diversity of your monocultural lawn will go up radically. And uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the best thing, right? But it, with, you can actually just save money and do less work. And as long as you abandon this idea of this perfect uniform monocultural lawn, um, we say we reduce uh, chemical runoff. We reduce the hydrocarbons produced by petrochemical manufacturing to make those chemicals. Um, and then maybe we got a little bit more pollinator support. So we want to change these ideas that the perfect lawn is, is what you want. And Freedom Lawn is, is not only okay, it's, it's good. Um, there's a new Maryland law that forces HOAs to um, not prevent you from putting native plants. This started, um, there's a big a legal battle. Um, this couple, um, they weren't really native plant lovers or, or zealots or whatever. They just kind of started doing it. And um, they got in a big legal battle with the HOA. I think it went to the state Supreme Court. That might not be true. Maybe it was a district court, but it, it escalated several levels. And they're finally like, no, the HOA can't make you not do this. So we're starting to get more awareness. And now you can't be prevented from rewilding your yard in Maryland. Um, another effort, this is Doug Tallamy. This is the, the book on the right from the beginning. This is Homegrown National Park. And he's taken his idea from his book online. So they have a map now um, where you can put your home, I'm here, um, and say how much you've rewilded. And the idea is that you can make the world's largest national park and it's everywhere, it's distributed, it's at home. And it's the one that you connect with, it's the ones that your neighbors see. And um, you know, so there's, there's stuff like that going on, which is, I think this is very interesting. I don't think it connects with the mainstream, but I think it's interesting. Um, there's a TV show now called Kill Your Lawn. They filmed here. Uh, at my house. Um, some of you are in this. Lydia, I guess, is not here. This is, this is Raul. Uh, thanks, Raul. <laughs> uh, he's in this, and this is spreading the word, like, killing your lawn is like a preposterous idea, right? But the fact that they're going nationwide filming a show about it and making it a good thing to kill your lawn is really, really like, like asking a bunch of questions. Um, this is on EarthX TV, which is only on Dish. It's really hard to get, so if, uh, let me know if you want to link. Uh, otherwise, it's hard to watch. And then, and then to me, what I'm most impressed by, and I still can't believe, is that our village of Pinecrest passed a resolution. I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, resolution is the right word. Um, that requires the village, this doesn't affect homeowners, right? But when the village plants on uh, parks and, 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 uh, and, and roadways, the village is now required to use native plants, which this is so incredibly amazing. I just I still can't believe that it's here. And, and this is happening locally. Right, so this idea that we're starting a movement, it's already there, right? I'm trying to make this like a positive, you know, what can you do, how can we pile on? And now Miami-Dade County is considering a resolution requiring Florida-friendly plants. And we're hoping to tighten it up a little bit and make it a little bit more ambitious. Uh, and we'll see where we get. Okay, so let's say you believe me now. We can use marketing, people, attitudes are changing, right? Will that be enough? And the answer is no, it's not enough, right? Uh, we need to increase access. So let's say your neighbor right now says, I'm convinced I want to get native plants. How do I get them? It's like, oh, well, <laughs> that's, that's a complicated question. So I see three major issues. The good news is that there's lots of native plants, right? And the bad news is that there's lots of native plants. If you want a simple answer, what are the three things that you get? Well, that's like not the answer, right? I'm like, okay, fine. I want 15 things. I want more biodiversity. Which ones do I get? It's still like not the answer. There's so much to choose from. I mean, just look at the table, right? It'll drive anyone crazy who does, who's not from it, who doesn't know why and, and how to do things, how to get started. So we need to address this and make it easier to choose. Number two is access to plants. Um, some of our best nurseries are wholesale only. Um, Silent the Na Native only serves the public once a month because Steve does it, right? Um, our, our vice president, right? So we really need to increase access. And then also like installation and care is a big deal, right? People who are not into plants are not gonna suddenly be good at being into plants nor knowing um, how our ecosystems work, like what, what, what spaces people need. So we really need to, to help people and, and solve these challenges. 
So the Street Force Miami started out as an experiment for marketing. Now phase two uh, is selling plants online. So I went into e-commerce. Not for profit. It's really weird. I'm trying to pitch you on entrepreneurship and using money. But not for profit. I want to sell plants online. The target persona, uh, just, just think of a characterization, right? A persona, like a Tesla owner who um, compared to other people, compared to maybe like a, a more average person, they might have disposable income. They might be short on time. Uh, someone has a Tesla, they've probably told you about it. So they'd be uh, a bit of an influencer. Um, they are, or they would like to look eco-friendly um, and they want modern conveniences. So if this person, if you convince them through Instagram ads that they should get native plants now, the, the American flag exotic plant guy, right? What do they do? So to me, um, uh, that's, that's a one click shopping. That's Amazon for native plants. Um, but it's not, you know, well, what would you like? It's, it's much more constrained. It's like ordering at McDonald's, okay? That means a few things. So first of all, we take an ecosystem approach. It's not what plant do you want out of these 800? It's what area is it? Is it high and dry, right? So to us, that means Pine Rockland. Um, is, it, uh, is it shaded and often wet? And that might be like a lowland hammock or, you know, cypressy thing. So we take an ecosystem approach for helping them narrow down what's relevant. We do uh, farmer's choice. So you don't have to pick your plants. You get a plant pack. The farmer picks, right? So that they can rotate what goes in it based upon what's, what's the best crop they have. Um, they can maximize biodiversity by pushing things on you you might never pick. Um, and then we need to include uh, delivery and installation. So it's, so it's truly one click. If I wanna just throw money at a problem and, and I'm shopping on Instagram, you can just be successful and have it show up and enjoy the benefits. Um, so this is, this is what we're gonna do. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna play with this online next. Joey offered to help. Thanks, Joey. Uh, um, so this, this is how I would approach this problem of creating access to people who've responded to an Instagram ad about native plants and wanna go buy something, the consumer, right? Um, is just have plant packs, right? It's based upon the number of square footage. Um, you don't get to pick what's in it, but you do pick by your area. So in here, there's a description that says, what kind of ecosystem would you like? You don't pick an ecosystem, you pick your conditions. But then we're like, okay, look, you'll get a pack of seven plants and Pine Rockland will have a pine tree. Uh, maybe a small or medium shrub, some ground covers, maybe a medium sized tree in there. You don't know what you're gonna get. It's gonna be a surprise. Um, but if you click uh, pay for installation, it'll show up at your house, it'll get installed and boom, you'll have native plants, right? And you'll, you'll now be able to identify as a native plant owner, right? As someone who's taken the first step and you can start building this addiction that we all have um, and, and, and get on your journey. But this is impossible today, right? If you wanna get started, it's like, okay, well go, go read five books, uh, go tour nurseries in the Redlands, the ones you can get into and then install the wrong things and have it all die and then, and then wonder why you failed. Right, so we really need to help. Uh, no, this is this is so nobody buys. Uh, but I just I need I need help. I'm out of time. I do this at five in the morning. Uh, so if anyone wants to help, please. So um, so here's some advertising concepts. Um, I want to do uh, love gifts and hate trash. Um, people tell me I'm hard to buy for. And I'm like for years I've been telling you don't buy me anything. Uh, get me plants. So imagine you could do a birthday registry for plants. So people, people stop buying you like the future garbage that they think that you want. And instead you can get plants or they can be plants somewhere else. They don't, you don't have to get the plants, right? Let's say you don't have any more space. You can, you can put to restoration. So I, I would love to redirect this like gift giving consumerist culture that we have to another outlet. And then just like inspire people, right? Like, you know, this whole Snow White idea. Is it Snow White, right? Yeah. Uh, that you can be surrounded by animals and it's amazing. Like I went to Roger Hammer's house and it was so loud. It, it was like being in the aviary at the zoo. And, and, and you forget, like that, that's, how it's, that's how it always was, you know? And, and now all you hear is the, is the leaf blowers that they're still blowing after the ban. It's, it's completely wrong. Um, so let's, let's start tying it in a little bit and we'll, we'll, we'll probably close soon. Um, so how will any of this help with the Holocene extinction, right? Because I've talked about small stuff, online stuff. So the idea is to go nationwide, uh, like McDonald's, okay? So, First step is build an audience, right? Get people to like on it, learn what they click on, learn what messages work. Next is prove that e-commerce works. So this is how we add entrepreneurship to what is, you know, just me being annoying on social media. Show that people will buy anything at all. And then figure out the demand generation channels, understand the unit economics. I'm, I'm gonna nerd out on this stuff. I won't do it too much here. 
but prove that there's a business to be had here, even if it's a not-for-profit business. And then if I can do that, if we can do that, if anybody wants to help, then I think we create a playbook, meaning like literally the manual on how to start a McDonald's, they have a three ring binder. Or we'll make the manual on how to start a reforest, whatever your city is, and franchise it. So that means we go um, recruit local city leaders, um, help them raise philanthropic money, because we're the ones with the credibility. We're the ones who've done this. And hey, don't you want this you know, uh, rich philanthropist in another city? Wouldn't you want this to happen in yours? All you have to do is insert dollars. And then we'll get this up and running and repeat and go nationwide. So this is the Connect and Protect network map, which to me, I'm just so inspired by this, like the amount of impact. Like we really have connected, not we, like, thanks, Danielle. <laughs> I've really connected uh, many, many like remaining tracks of, of native habitat, but there's no reason we can't have that model nationwide um, and, and do this. We just have to prove that it works. You know, and um, we don't even have to do this, right? As long as you prove that it works, my hope is that someone just steals the idea, right? And just does it themselves. And that's, that's more resilient, this decentralized thing, because now like no one's in charge of it, right? It's just, it just happens, right? And it happens much faster than, than anyone can manage. So this, this, is, this is my pitch about how these ideas all connect together. And it's been done a lot of times before. This isn't new. Um, everyone knows the McDonald's story. Um, Uber did this, right? Because they had such regulatory hurdles in every new city they wanted to go into and break the laws. They had to have a local there who would work the government and do all that sort of stuff. The norms were different. Um, even True Green, like the enemy, these are the chemical guys. They, they have franchising, right? So like, why, why can't we? Why can't we franchise if we can just define a business and then you take this concept of reforest Miami, and then you have to change the tree, right? But uh, like, I, I don't know the plants in Cleveland or Denver or Portland or Boston, uh, but someone else does. There's someone in a room like this right now or this month who is the person who will respond to this message. And if you just give them the playbook, they'll, they'll, they'll do it. So, um, so this, that's, that's, that's my pitch. Um, do I have any time or am I out? We uh, could have some time for questions. It's still relatively... Okay, I'll do five minutes on drones. Okay, let's do technology. Okay, so um, so this is real. This is very possible. This is happening. I can't do it myself. I don't have the answers. I need help from everybody here and from many, many more people. But if this all appeals to you, um, this is my this is my pitch to you: is is how can we get involved? How does FNPS back this or not? But how do we make this a reality? Okay, um, so this is all chapter one of how do you how do you um, renaturalize where we live and work, right? Our home, our developed areas. I think there's an equal need to renaturalize undeveloped areas. So this means places where we've chopped everything down, but it's either farms, it's vacant land, it's something with a lower use that we can, that we can do. Um, so I think the specific opportunity, I'm going to get really technology heavy now. Um, you, have you heard of vertical farming? Okay. My favorite salad from Milam's is grown in Hialeah. It's incredible. It's like uh, citrus, some citrus pop. I don't know. They have it there in the thing. It's it's uh, fully hydroponic. It's grown indoors. It's automated, and one crop at a time. Not all of them, right? You can't grow mangoes inside a robotic tray, but definitely leafy greens. They're doing cherry tomatoes like this now, um, and then also, I think aggressive bioengineering is going to come in, where one species at a time. Some of them will be grown indoors uh, more efficiently and with better outcome than growing outdoors because you can control the environment. You can have the right amount come out. You don't have a, a, you know, a, big, a big crop season and then, and then you know, flying them from overseas um, during the off season. Um, and then this is way better for the environment, right? When you, when you irrigate outdoors, 95% of the water does not turn into plant material uh, and the fertilizer runs off. And here, any, any chemicals that are used are contained in a self-enclosed system of water. This is way better for the environment. Um, I think this is going to take off. I hope it does, because then it'll create an opportunity to rewild that former agricultural land. So as long as this becomes available faster than they can build condos on it, uh, <laughs> that's my hope. It'll just become barren. It'll just become boring. We'll have Brazilian peppers live here and Australian pines and all that sort of stuff. So, so I think that's an opportunity that's coming up. The thing is, uh, labor is too expensive to return that land to nature and not have it be just like invasive species breeding grounds. We, we need automation. It's, it's a must. It's never going to happen. If someone gave you 100 square miles of land, you, just, you wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, it's not possible. So I think there's a big use for drones and mobile robots, which is this is what I do at work. Um, first of all, for data collection and observation, there is no inventory of all the trees in the Everglades. 
It's like, it doesn't exist. But what if you could know that, right? What if you could count all the Brazilian pepper in the Picayune and how many more are going up every year? Like even just having that information would bring a lot of transparency and a lot more action to the issue. So we need, uh, to me, this is a drone problem. It's for data collection and observation. Um, we need automated invasive species management. So this is, this is you know, killing the Malalucas with a, I, I actually don't know. I need, I need help from, from, from tree mitigation people. Um, so is it a poison dart? Is it whatever? Um, I think in a lot of cases, just these two are enough. I don't think that you need automated seeding, I'm, but I'm not the expert. Other people will know this. Um, if, you're, if you're adjacent to healthy lands and there's enough seed rain and, and natural transfer, that might just be enough. It's, you just keep the invasive species out and you can watch it. But if we want to accelerate it, um, then we do some kind of automated seeding. Depending on the area, these three can be aerial. Or if it's like dense canopy, if it's hammock and not pine rockland, you'll need something else for, for number two, maybe for number one. Um, and this, this exists. This is here now, okay? This is a row crop robot. It uses lasers for killing weeds, right, instead of pesticides. So now you can have a no pesticide, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you buy this robot. It's early, it's expensive, it catches fire, that kind of stuff. But <laughs> people, people are really working on this, right? Pesticide-free pesticide -free reading for row crops. Um, this is a company, uh, it's called Drone Seed. They've changed their name now. But this is literally a business for restoration post-wildfire. So there are studies that the wildfires in California, because of accumulation of, of underbrush and, and, like, and dead, dead material, they burn so hot that it's killed the seed bank. And I don't know if this is true, that's what they say. So it basically, it, it, won't, it won't bounce back. So they've built a company that does drone-based seeding uh, and also partners with other reforestation landowners to, 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 to help them with, with, with seeds for reforestation. Um, this is a company called Tree Swift. Tree Swift. They have drones for forestry. So if you have a timber forest, you want to know the ring diameter and inventory of all your trees so you can forecast your growth. You want to, um, they do a lot of control burns to keep out the invasives. So they, they do that. And they, these drones, this is a product you can get now. I know these people. Um, you, can, you can hire them to come and map your forest with, with, a, with a drone. Um, and, uh, and then this, this company called Terraformation, they started out with mobile seed banking and desalination for like super uh, remote uh, rewilding. It didn't work. <laughs> so they've switched to be now like an investment firm. So they're an accelerator. It's just like, uh, if you want to start up, you go get money from these people and then you can build one of those prior companies. So there's a lot of action now. This is like already happening. Um, and this is, this is my company. This is where I work. Um, we do fully autonomous drones. So if you've seen the Terminator with like the autonomous killer robots, <laughs> We, we do that. Um, it's not outdoors, they're, they're contained, um, but it's in, it's in warehouses. So the drones fly around and you, this is like a mega Costco, right? With, with things on racks and pallets. And we have drones that fly around and count things by themselves. Um, so you can do inventory in real time. And the reason I did this and it's not directly in rewilding is I think it's actually quite hard to build a business in nature, as you guys all know, there kind of like is no entrepreneurship. So my bet was build a big business in warehousing where there's tons of money and then use that to have a, a land management arm. So this is, this, is my, this is like my big plan of putting it all together. So, so I'll wrap up. So in summary, um, you know, I think core to our Native Plant Society mission, to my personal mission, I, I think all of us should have the mission of maximizing biodiversity retention because when it's gone, you can't get it back. And I think it's the most impactful thing we can do for the world. Um, there's a lot of reasons to hope and there's a lot of tools we have to fix this now. And, and now's the time to get involved, right? So uh, I have homework. Uh, if you weren't already annoyed, I have asks. Um, so I need help for this Reforest Miami, um, for social media and e-commerce management. You don't have to know how to do anything. I'll tell you how. But I just need like, like, like bodies to help with this stuff. Um, I badly need, this is a selfish ask, but I think everyone's gonna need it, is an uh, invasive weeding guide for South Florida for the novice homeowner, right? Hey, I got into native plants. I don't mow this space anymore. I stopped using the Roundup. What is this thing? Do I pull it or do I leave it, right? That's a huge um, you know, black hole for me where I don't know, I make a lot of mistakes and I, I would really benefit, a lot of people would from this, this resource that we can create. Um, I think we need a dirt rescue. So every time they go chop down more pine trees, I would love to go with a wheelbarrow and just bring some of it home <laughs> for mycorrhizae inoculation for just, getting any, this is, this is only okay for healthy stuff, but I would love to just bring seed back home and increase my own biodiversity. So I don't know why there's not a dirt exchange 
Um, I think we need a connect protect for terrestrial insects. Like I don't have Ligus tree snails and I don't have, I'm not gonna collect them. Um, I don't have golden orb spiders. I don't have a lot of stuff that I want for a healthy ecosystem. So there's, there's more places we can branch out if you know people. Um, we need a government liaison. So I'm working now with Village of Pinecrest and Brian's doing a lot of work. Uh, well, Brian, I guess is doing all the work, uh, but to come up with a plant list to help um, give the city options on, on, the, on the village options on what it will plant. Um, Ken, thank you, Ken, super involved. Um, so I think we need an official liaison here uh, that can be the person who builds good um, uh, government relationships and also is willing to compromise. You got to meet in the middle. Like, I don't think this is going to work if you're the purist and it's got to be perfect. I think we need to bring people, you know, over to slowly to, to what natives are like. Um, and if you want to get involved in the tech side, if there's tech people listening to this or if you're here, um, maybe, maybe David, you want to do this? <laughs> Um, a prototype for drone mapping and image processing. So Schaeffler have big leaves. If I had like an image of a square mile of you know, invaded land, you can find that stuff pretty easily. And I really wanna know um, techniques for invasive species mitigation that can be mounted on a drone, poison darts, torches, whatever. It sounds crazy, but um, if any of this like, is interesting to you or you know, please, please help. And uh, that's all I got, thank you. All right. Sorry for talking so fast. I get excited. I have a question. One challenge with that, with this whole program, is that uh, we have some people that have lived here forever. Their families are here. Their parents are here. Their grandparents are here. But we have a lot of people coming in, and I have seen a number of landscapes in my neighborhood where people started to put in the natives, and it looked really interesting. And then the household, and suddenly got ripped out, mm -hmm. and they put in more. Yeah. And so, um, what what are your thoughts on, especially in this city? Very demographic of um, you know the people targeting older areas, taking fix, fixer houses, and and they just basically take out everything that was there and put it more. Yeah. Thoughts? Okay, I'm going to repeat the question for the online. Um, so, if, if I understand correctly, it's how do we um, solve the problem of new people coming to Miami, not knowing or caring about what's native, and ripping out what's there? and kind of resetting. And to me, it's like, people wanna copy what cool rich people do. I'm sorry to make that like a pejorative, but, but it's sort of there. And I think we need to make it cool to have native plants. Um, that I think has to do with influence marketing for um, how do you get celebrities involved? How do you make this like a thing that people wanna copy? Also, I think we need to reset the look, ironically to what the look really was, right? So. That's part of why I'm so excited, so excited about the Pinecrest Village Resolution, is that the native plants that the village is going to install are in the most conspicuous places. It's like where you drive every day. It's not in someone's backyard, whatever. So, it's a hard problem. I don't know how to solve it, but I think I think making it cool somehow, and also making it the norm, is gonna is gonna be the first the first thing that I would try to to address the issue of people new people not knowing what to put. Nobody markets the landscape. They market the kitchen, the yeah. side of the house, whether it's the pool or the back, they're not marketing the landscape. Yeah. So if we if we say like, hey, uh, this house has fewer mosquitoes because we have dragonfly attracting plants, I'm making it up. That could be a universal appeal, ultra selfish thing, but I mean there's ways that you can like break into that. Um oh. Small area, bigger area, 
You know, the thing I like most about this is that it offers a lot of really fresh perspectives and takes on, on an issue that we're constantly wrapping our brains on. So it's really great to get some, some perspective. Um, and I'm always for introducing these, these, uh, these new ideas and seeing what opportunities there are to do things differently and see what, what works. Because what works for one area might not work for another. So I'm really more people try to get stuff on your passion, try to take a try to do it. It's being important. Yeah. And I would say that the big hurdle, uh, or the one of the big hurdles in getting these projects started is having enough enough uh, involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and that's something that I always want to encourage. You know, everybody, you guys as members, or even as as just uh, a post work student, if you're not there. There's a lot of opportunities to try, you know, to do new projects. And if you want to become involved, that, that's really what we need. That's, that's the main tech package that, that prevents us from doing, from doing things. And bring it up, like you brought a couple of contracts that were made that probably was close to what he's talking about with the doors on the main path. I, I definitely want to continue the conversation and see where where you know this this concept and, and you know, what what our mission as uh, as as uh, US, where where that can intersect potentially and, and see how how those two missions can be uh, can, can help each other. Yeah, that'd be great. There was a discussion just now about um, what parts of this would the Native Plant Society want to get involved in. Um, interesting. And I don't actually think the Native Plant Society should get completely into this business because there's things that are not appropriate for the Plant Society, right? The ultra commercial stuff, you know, a little bit of teasing on Instagram. It's like not just not part, it's not, doesn't work for the brand, but we have different tools to do this, right? And we should use all of our tools as part of a bigger plan. Cool. Have you have a question? Yeah. That's right. Yes, that, that's totally great. The the comment was about uh, outreach to children, getting them involved, and getting them at an early age. I think it is amazing. Daniela. If you want to start a dirt camp, I can contribute two children. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I think I think we need a government liaison, right? Someone here who's who knows how to work that stuff, like can just build relationships. I think it's an important role. Um, uh, I think we have time for one last question. If there is one. And 
Cool, thank you. They cut an oak tree in half and then they take it somewhere and they wrap it. So, do they think it's going to grow? They have a way that makes it work and it survives. Yeah, I'll send you the article. Yeah, it's Wall Street Journal. I have it. Uh, when, when we wrap up, I'll, I'll give it to you. <laughs> Again, Charlie. All right, thank you. And once you uh, go wrap up tickets for the next maybe 10 to 15 minutes, and we'll let you uh, go. Okay.